Yes. Dr. Pettigrew, in the first half of the 1980s, when a previously untreated patient presented to York Hill, what would the process have been for deciding how to treat them? Um, I think I can't really say with any certainty, to be honest. Um, I would hope that an untreated patient might have been treated with concentrate, uh, sorry, with cryo, but it would depend on the presentation and the type of feed that they presented with. And um, so, and, and whether they were a patient who suffered from severe haemophilia or moderate or mild haemophilia. So, um, as I say, I can't really answer that with any certainty. Would the decision as to how to treat a previously untreated patient have been yours or another member of the clinical staff, or would that be reserved to one of the consultants? Well, it would have been reserved for the consultant. So Dr. Willoughby or then Dr. Han after 1983? It, yes. Uh -huh. um, we'll, we'll no doubt be hearing from Professor Han tomorrow um, about his approach uh, when he arrived in 1983. But I want to ask you what you recollect about that. We know he there was a switch to almost entirely SNBTS concentrates. Can, can you recall any discussions with uh, Professor Han uh, about his reasoning in that regard? I, I can't say I recall any particular discussions. I know that he was very keen to introduce a policy um, which he introduced for the use of uh, cryo in untreated and new patients and children and to use um, NHS concentrate rather than commercial concentrate and um, I presume he must have discussed that it was to try and reduce the risk of any um, infection because obviously by 1983 there was some discussion about the possible um, cause of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. But you can't recall any specific conversations now? We must have had a conversation but I couldn't you know, give you specific. Again I think Professor Ham will tell us tomorrow about producing some written standard operating procedures or, or, or policies. Prior to um, his arrival, had there been any written policies or protocols as to how to treat patients? With haemophilia, no. Uh, I just want to look at a couple of documents with you about heat-treated products prior to 1985. Shame it, could we have ARMO 40137, please? So we can see here, Dr. Pettigrew, a letter from Armour dated the 13th of March 1984. It's addressed to the Medicines Division at the Department of Health and Social Security. Um, and it says, dear sirs, uh, it refers to a CTX uh, number and then heat treated factor eight. We wish to add the following additional investigators to our clinical trial exemption 0231-00708 a for heat treated factor eight. And then um, your name and Dr. Han's name and then we see Professor Hardesty at Great Ormond Street. What, what, if anything, can you recall about, about your involvement with this process? Um, I, I really can't recall anything. Um, when, when this document was sent to me, I, I, I couldn't recall the situation. I presume because it was 19 March 84 that Dr Han might have felt that if um, we had an... Um, an untreated patient that required concentrate that um, it might be better to use a heat treated rather than an unheat treated product at that time um, and I presume that this would have been licensed then and perhaps was part of a trial but I, I don't really remember. Do you recall actually giving a heat treated factor 8 to any patient at this time? Uh, I don't recall giving it to anybody no. Um, this when do you recall first using heat treated products? Well, um, I know that there was a small amount sent to uh, at Glasgow and Edinburgh by SNBTS in December of 
84. I think it was, they said approximately a month's supply. Now, whether that included York Kale at the time, I don't know. Um, and then I, I think heat treated factory was supplied in um, sort of regular amounts from January 85. And I think as I had forgotten during the Penrose inquiry, but remembered when I was preparing my written evidence for this inquiry, I went on maternity leave probably um, mid to end of January till the beginning of May. So it might have been May 1985 before I had experienced a reading, or it may have been in January 1985. Um, did uh, you have any involvement that you can recall with any uh, earlier use of SNBTS heat-treated products on a, on a clinical trial basis? I recall no. Now, you've told us about um, your understanding of, of hepatitis risks as being essentially about hepatitis B. When do you recall learning about non-A, non-B hepatitis? Um, well, in the evidence I gave to Penrose, I said it was probably toward uh, mid-80s. But in fact, um, having been watching the clinical evidence and your presentation of evidence, I remember um, when the uh, Professor Preston's paper of 1985 was shown, I remember that I had actually gone to a meeting, I think I said in my Penrose um, statement that I learned of Professor Preston's work, but I went to a meeting in the Royal Free, and I think it must have been 1984, before the publication of that paper, and the work of Professor Preston, and I think also Professor, um, was it, um, I'm getting mixed up with names, was it Zimmerman or Zuckerman, from the Royal Free also presented work on liver biopsies in patients with haemophilia and it was then that I became aware that um, non-A, non-B hepatitis, as I learned to call it then, was could possibly be cause severe liver, liver damage in patients. So um, uh, is, is this right that you, you weren't actually aware of non-A, non-B hepatitis as a concept in, until around 1984? I don't think so, no. Uh, did you ever have any discussions with Dr. Willoughby, or did he ever give you any advice about risks of hepatitis? Um, risk of hepatitis B and the fact that we, you know, regularly or whenever opportunity arose to check hepatitis B status in patients. Uh, but other than that, there was never any um, discussion about what um, I subsequently knew to be non A, non B hepatitis. Um, you, you've mentioned the, the later Preston paper. Were you aware at the time of the earlier work that Professor Preston had undertaken in 1978? No, I wasn't aware of that paper at all, no. And we know that, um, that there was a paper published in 1980, specifically um, looking at the position of children, published by Lilliman and others. Was, was that something you were aware of? What, what were the sources of information that you had in the first half of the 80s to keep up to date with scientific and medical developments? Well, um, as was probably quite common in those days, it was, so my position not being a training post and not training for a specialty, um, a lot of information would come, um, as somebody said, it would cascade down the hierarchy. So from my my colleagues and um, obviously my seniors um, and um, going to meetings um, that would be the main source of, of information. What journals did you read in regularly in the first half of the 80s? Well I have to confess I didn't actually I didn't uh, subscribe to any journals um, I didn't have ready access to journals um, because of my situation, you know, to, to have access to a journal, I'd need to go to the library, but because of my situation, I tended to go to um, York Hill in the morning and it was usually a question of 
rushing home late um, in the afternoon, so there wasn't really time to go and sit in the library and read journals. And I had let my subscription for the BMA uh, lapse when I left the Royal Infirmary, and I didn't resubscribe to the BMJ till probably later in, I think, 1988, when they introduced um, a special subscription for those that were earning less than a certain amount a year. You, you, you may recall being asked about this by the chair at the Penrose inquiry, but uh, is, is this right that, the, the, that there wasn't at York Hill in, in the early 80s at least any kind of system for providing junior doctors such as yourself with updates about um, medical and clinical developments? Uh, probably not. There might have been a better system for those in training, such as the Leukaemia Research Fellow or the Haematology Registrars and SHOs. You, you referred in your statement to acquiring information from scientific meetings, and you've given an example of the meeting you attended in 1984 at the Royal Free. Um, how often, again, in the first half of the 80s, would you be attending similar meetings? Uh, I couldn't really recall. Richards, I, I couldn't give you a, a figure for that. We did have, well, not scientific meetings, but we did have, um, you know, in York Hill, obviously, there was a weekly clinical meeting <coughs> uh, for everybody in the hospital. Um, and um, in the, the morning meetings that we had as a team, a haematology team before the ward rounds, I think Dr. Willoughby would have um, told us about any startling um, innovations or but, but there was never really very much about haemophilia discussed. Um, now, in terms of the information that was given to patients, we've touched on this to some extent already. Um, but before I ask you specifically about the provision of information about, about hepatitis, um, what, to what extent was advice or information provided to, to parents about lifestyle and how to manage lifestyle and activities to reduce the risk of serious bleeds? Well, that was something that uh, was discussed with them um, often and repeatedly. Um, you know, we talked about the types of um, sport that they could and couldn't engage with. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, and, and ways of, of, of trying to prevent bleeds without seriously restricting um, their normal lifestyle. Um, so, so that was emphasised, really. Do parents ever ask you about the relative risks, or sorry, the relative safety of the, the, the treatments that they were using? I don't recall in the early 80s, no, any parents asking about the relative risks of, of um, products. Um, when do you first recall any such discussions taking place? I think when um, the uh, when the acquired immune deficiency syndrome was beginning to appear, and you know questions were being asked about that, I, I will go and we'll come on to that in a few minutes more specifically. Um, did Dr. Willoughby ever give you any advice um, or instruction or guidance as to the kind of information to provide to patients about the risks of treatment? Not that I can recall. But obviously, um, Dr. Willoughby um, made sure, and we all made sure that the Haemophilia Society the patients were encouraged to join the Haemophilia Society, and you know the leaflets were available in the in the in the treatment room in the day bed, and then subsequently up in Ward Seven A. Given what you've told us about your own understanding about hepatitis risks up until a point in 1984. Does it follow that you wouldn't have been telling patients or their parents about the risks of non-A, non-B hepatitis because you weren't aware of it particularly and you weren't aware of its potential seriousness? Up until 1984, yes, that's correct. Um, once you did become aware, following your attendance at the meeting you described in 1984, did your practice change in terms of what you told patients? Well, it changed in that when I was checking the liver function tests, um, I would say, I'm, and you know, I'll check liver function tests um, because you know we know that 
in some patients with haemophilia that can be abnormal. <clears throat> and we also know now that in some of these patients, they can progress to more severe liver disease. So but that I didn't, I don't, and I, I think I would have perhaps said, um, and we don't know if this is due to um, you know, a, a virus, but we think it's not due to uh, hepatitis A and it's not due to hepatitis B. So th that's your best recollection of from, from sometime in 1984 onwards? That would be my recollection of what I would... So I would give them an indication that there was a possibility that in some patients with haemophilia, the abnormalities in liver function tests could progress to more serious liver disease. And that it was possibly due to a virus which wasn't hepatitis A and wasn't hepatitis B. In your witness statement to this inquiry, um, show me if it's WITN 3527002, please. And if we go to page nine, please. We just look at the, the first paragraph at the top of the page. You say this, where a child who was normally treated with cryoprecipitate received factor concentrate as treatment for a bleeding episode requiring prompt control and high levels of circulating factor eight. The reason for this will be discussed with par the parents. Moreover, when training for home therapy, the rationale for using factor concentrate as opposed to cryoprecipitate would be explained. Could you just tell us what you mean by that? What, what, what are the reasons or the rationale that would be given to patients in those circumstances? I think there I would be talking about um, probably from the point of view of the nature of the bleeding episode and the requirement <coughs> for treating that bleeding episode. I don't think there would have been a discussion there about um, the different risks. C coming on then to your n knowledge of uh, AIDS and the possible association with uh, uh, blood products. Um, can we look first of all at a statement you gave to the Penrose inquiry? Shemek, it's PRSE 301126. Um, if we look uh, at the paragraph that's numbered A, bottom half of the page um, you can see we can see that you say in the third line during the period when there was increasing concern that a transmissible infectious agent was present in blood and blood products 82 to 83 we would advise parents of this concern but at that time there was no definite proof so just ask you to note that so I'm going to show you one other document it, again and, and then ask you a question about it so you use there the terminology of definite proof if we then look at PRSC 303995, which is another statement you gave to the Penrose Inquiry. And if we go to the second page, please, Shane make paragraph 10, which is halfway down the page. You say in paragraph 10, in the second line, as far as I can recall, I would have been first aware of the possibility of that AIDS was caused by an agent transmitted by blood and blood products in 1983. So I've those I've, uh, in some respect as an aid to um, memory. W what can you recall uh, about learning of, uh, about AIDS and the, and the possibility that AIDS might uh, infect haemophiliacs? First of all, I think the first document you showed where I said 82, 83, I think in my oral statement to Penrose, I corrected that to 83. Um, and the first, I, I remember the, um, first becoming aware in 1983, um, I think it was the, the Leukemia Research Fellow um, advised me that he had read the paper in the New England Medical Journal. Um, which had dis um, related the uh, AIDS occurring in patients with haemophilia in the United States. Um, and that was the first I, I was aware that it was um, occurring in patients with haemophilia. So does it follow from that that 
<clears throat> it's not something which in the second half of 1982, Dr. Willoughby had raised or discussed with you at all? No. Um, um, what, if anything, can you recall about how your knowledge and understanding in relation to AIDS developed in the course of 1983? Um, I think, you know, I, I've, I probably, well, obviously kept up to date with, there was a lot in the press and um, about it and by that time Dr Han had arrived and I think there would have been discussions with him about um, the progression of knowledge of AIDS um, and as I say I, at some point I did and, and obviously we would be going if there was any meetings that were appropriate we would be sent to them and um, as I said in my statement, I did um, try and obtain and did manage to obtain the MMWR. Um, but I'm not sure when that would have been, but you know, I felt that was a one of the best ways of keeping up with um, the d development of the knowledge of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. C can you remember uh, uh, the, the detail or content of any of your discussions with Dr. Han about um, AIDS in the course of '83? I can't remember any detail about discussions, no. Do you recall whether you became aware in the course of 1983 of the um, fact that a patient in Cardiff uh, was understood to uh, be suffering from AIDS, a haemophiliac patient? I can't say with any certainty, but it was probably, it's more, it's likely that I would have been informed by Dr. Ann. Do you have any recollection of learning about the death in August of 1983 of a patient in Bristol? Uh, from AIDS, a haemophiliac patient? Again, at this point, I don't have any recollection, but I would assume that Dr Han, if he knew about it, would have informed me. Um, what, to the best of your recollection, what information, if any, was provided to parents about um, AIDS and when? Well, there wasn't any specific guidance or policy in place as to what to say to parents. I think, as Dr. Han mentioned in his evidence, we operated a very open policy where we would try and be honest and open with parents. And that open policy also operated from the point of view of the parents being free, feeling free and able to call in and um, discuss with um, Sister particularly Sister Murphy and myself, anything that we were concerned about. So I think that over the, the period, end of 83 and throughout 84, we would have had numerous discussions, I'm sure, with a uh, majority of patients, parents of patients with hemophilia who were on treatment, particularly home treatment, about um, AIDS and about our state of knowledge at the time. There was also, again, information from the Haemophilia Society and lots of information in the press, etc. In terms of the information from the Haemophilia Society, did you yourself actually read what the Haemophilia Society was saying in their bulletins to see whether you yes. thought it was appropriate? Yes, I would read the Haemophilia Society bulletins, yes. Would the Haemophilia Society bulletins have been um, part of the information that contributed to your understanding of the risk of AIDS? It, they, they were probably part of that, yes. Um, if we look at your statement again, please, Dr. Pettigrew, WITN 3527002. Yeah, WITN If we go to page 16, I'm going to show you a passage, a short passage from this and a short passage from your evidence to Lord Penrose and then ask you some questions, Dr. Pettigrew. So if we look at page 16, halfway down the page, go a little further down, you, you say this, there was no policy as to inform parents about the risks of HIV, which were not identified until 83, 84, and the knowledge about the risks of transmission of a causative agent and the natural history of the disease evolved slowly, um, and, and you contrast it with the introduction of the internet in the present crisis. 
Initial discussions with parents were of the state of knowledge at the time and as knowledge evolved, parents would be informed. So that, that's what your written statement to this inquiry says. If we go then to your oral evidence to the Penrose inquiry where you were asked about it in a little more detail, it's PRSE 306020. And if we go, please, to page 45, show Mick. We pick it up in line nine. You say this. If parents, it would usually be parents voiced concerns, we would say that, as I have stated, there was a possibility. The possibility had been raised, but at that time there was no definite evidence. Uh, there was still a lot of debate even among the experts as to whether or not there was a definite infectious agent and the advice at the time was that they should continue with therapy but obviously I would be following advice that I would be given by my seniors. Then towards the bottom of the page, line 23, you say the majority of parents would voice concerns because they were a well-informed group and obviously most of our parents were in contact with the Haemophilia Society and would be aware of this. So I've just gone to the next page. Um, then if we go down to line 18, we can see you say, I can't recall any specific policy with regards to discussing with parents the risk of AIDS. Line 22, you would talk about how parents would call in, um, usually just for a chat. That would be the time when the concerns would be raised. And if we go to the next page, please, Shamek, bottom half of the page, if we pick it up at line um, 20 you've been asked about where such conversations might take place and you say you know you might just be talking to them wherever you were and they would bring up this concern um, Dr Pettigrew the, the impression that that, that <coughs> evidence m might be said to give is that there wasn't a proactive policy of informing patients about the risks of AIDS but if it was something that parents raised with you you would then discuss it with them is that fair? I think that's fair, but I would also say that over that period, as I said, the majority of parents would have brought up their concerns about it because it was something that was very obviously in the forefront of their minds at that time. <clears throat> but there was no policy to um, you know, write to parents and say, come in and we'll discuss this <coughs> problem. <Excuse me. coughs> that's been appearing in the press. But I, I would it's sort of thinking, I've been thinking about it and, and um, my reflection would be that the majority of, of parents would have been, and I have to say when I say parents, it was predominantly the mothers that we spoke to um, and I, I think the majority of them would have had that dis a discussion with us and as I say, what we just told them in that discussion would have depended on the knowledge at the time um, and that evolved over that period. So um, if what you were telling them depended on, on your evolving knowledge, would you be telling them essentially the same message as, we, as, as you were picking up from the Haemophilia Society, um, using words such as no definite proof or no, no conclusive evidence? I think um, when I used no definite proof there, I think I'm referring to the fact that the virus hadn't been isolated until... Um, into, well, I suppose Montagne was perhaps 83 and Gala was 84. Um, but I would have um, followed any um, knowledge that I'd acquired through discussions with Dr Han, and he obviously would have the minutes from the uh, UKHCD amongst other sources. Um, so is this right? You, you can't remember what actually you said to parents... Um, uh, and what you said may have changed over time as your understanding changed. I think that's correct, yes. Do you accept that as a matter of principle, the parents of the boys at York Hill had a right to know that factor concentrates might infect their children with a fatal disease for which there was no treatment? I think when that became... Um, when it was apparent that that was the case, 
it would have been better if they had been informed and perhaps if there had been a policy not only in our unit but in all units um, to inform parents and patients of this. And as I say, it was a, I, I think you've heard before, it was a difficult time, it was a time of confusion, it was a time of evolving evidence and um, you know, it's, we can look back and say, yes, you know, we should have done it better. But at the time, um, there was a lot of, there still was a bit of confusion and, um, but we could have done it better, yes. Do, do, do you recall a time coming at which you and, and or Dr Han actually did spell out to parents um, that, that this was a, um, a likely or potential risk of the fact of treatment, that their child could develop a fatal disease for which there was no treatment? Well, I think part of that would be when we were changing to NHS concentrate, because we would explain to the parents, as I say, you know, up, up until probably the question of AIDS arose, the parents quite liked using their commercial concentrate. So we would have to explain to them that we were changing to the NHS concentrate because it was felt that that carried less of a risk of transmitting AIDS at that time, it was thought anyway. Um, so that would be part of the discussion as well. Um, do you recall ever discussing with telling a parent about uh, the Cardiff case or the Bristol case? I can't recall telling uh, any parent about those cases. Um, and I don't know if it, if such it would have come up in discussion if perhaps they had seen it in the press. I don't know, but I can't recall. The the, the policy at York Killers, I understand it was was to continue using concentrates, albeit the concentrates would be SMBTS rather than commercial concentrates. Um, w w were you therefore um, offering reassurance to parents? Um, that the treatment was safe? No, I think we were saying to parents that it is thought that the SNBTS reduced concentrate added less of a risk. At that time, there was no cases reported in Scotland and it was thought to carry less of a risk of transmitting the, the, the putative agent for acquired immune deficiency syndrome um, at that time. Would any of the discussions that you're referring to about risks of AIDS have been documented in the patient's records? Well, again, reflecting on that, I don't think so, because these discussions would be unscheduled visits by the parent, usually, to the, the treatment room. The um, case notes were held centrally in the records office, and they were only brought to the treatment room when a when, the, when a patient came, so we wouldn't have had the notes. And again, perhaps we should have gone and got the notes and recorded these discussions in the notes, but at the time that wasn't the practice. Was any parent in, in, in 83 or 84, specifically because of the risk of AIDS, offered the choice to return to treatment with cryoprecipitate? As far as I recall, I think there was certainly one or perhaps two parents that um, asked about using cryoprecipitate, and I, um, those two parents, uh, those two patients, did use cryoprecipitate. But as far as I recall, it then became hospital-based rather than home treatment-based treatment. What if any steps were taken at York Hill? Um, uh, uh, first of all, under Dr. Willoughby, to reduce or minimise the risk of patients becoming infected with a virus? Well, I think Dr. Willoughby, as he said in his statement, was unaware of the risk of AIDS um, at his time at York Hill. Um, Dr. Han, as we've discussed, introduced a policy of using SNBTS back to rate rather than commercial factory, because it was thought to carry less of a risk of transmitting the acquired immune deficiency virus or the putative agent at that time. And he also introduced a policy, a written policy, of using cryoprecipitate 
in newly diagnosed, previously untreated patients and in the younger children, not in home therapy. And obviously milder patient, uh, patients who had mild and or moderate haemophilia and in von Willebrand's disease. Just, just if, if, we, if we leave oh, aside... Sorry, can I just also say Dr Han wasn't... Um, at that time didn't support prophylactic treatment and I think um, over that period um, prophylactic treatment was um, to, a, to a greater or lesser extent reduced. Just, just sticking if we may for a moment before to the time before Dr Han's arrival so whilst Dr Willoughby was, was still um, the consultant in charge of the service um, and leaving aside what he did or didn't know about AIDS um, um, what if any steps were taken or, or um, um, how were the risks of infection with hepatitis reflected in the treatment policies at York Hill under Dr Willoughby? Well, again, um, reading um, Dr Han's statement and his record of what Dr Willoughby had said to him, Dr Willoughby's opinion was that the, the question of transmission of hepatitis through commercial products had been partly addressed by improved donor selection and screening. So I, I would have to say I don't think there was any um, uh, steps taken. Um, sorry, Mr. Richard, could you just repeat the original yes, question? Yes, of course. It was a slightly convoluted question. Um, under Dr Willoughby, what, if any, steps were taken to reduce or minimise the risk of patients being infected with a virus, whatever that virus might be? Well, as I've just said, you know, his opinion about um, the reduced risk of hep or the evolving reduced risk of hepatitis. So there, there wouldn't have been any particular steps taken, I don't think. In relation to, to the time from 1983 onwards under Dr Han, you've referred to um, the, the change to SMBTS product and to a reduction in prophylaxis. Was any consideration given, as far as you can recall, to stopping home treatment? No. Was any consideration given to um, a significantly increased use of cryoprecipitate? For home treatment? Um, either for home treatment or in hospital? I think the, the use of cryoprecipitate was as outlined in the policy that Dr Han instituted at the time. So in terms of home treatment, was there any consideration, as far as you can recall, given to... Uh, using cryoprecipitate for home treatment? Not on a general basis, no. As I say, there was two patients, two situations where cryo was <coughs> used, but it wasn't given as home treatment. Can I come on then to ask you about the circumstances in which it was learnt at York Hill that um, a significant number of the children had been infected with HTLV3? Um, your evidence to the Penrose inquiry was that testing was carried out by a Dr Follett of the Regional Virology Lab on stored serum samples. Is that right? That's correct. Now, just dealing with the question of the samples, first of all, do I correctly understand your evidence to, to Penrose to have been that you, you weren't aware that samples were being stored? That's correct. But again, listening to evidence given by clinicians, um, I wasn't aware that it seemed to have been accepted practice in virology departments at that time. Did, did you um, or, or, the, or the sister or Dr Willoughby ever arrange for samples to be stored of, of patient Sarah? Uh, neither Sister Murphy or I or Sister Wright would have arranged for um, samples to be stored. Um, I don't know what um, if samples were stored in the haematology lab, but I don't think so. I, I wasn't aware of any. If you and the, so if you and the haemophilia sisters were not aware of the of samples being stored, um, um, whether in the haematology lab or in virology, would it follow logically that the patients or their parents are unlikely to have been aware that that was the practice? I think they're unlikely to have been aware that that was the practice, yes. And as far as you understand, the testing that was undertaken by Dr Follett was testing which the parents were unaware of at the time? 
Yes, and as far as I recall, certainly I was unaware of it, and I think Dr Han was unaware of it. Do you know anything about what led Dr Follett to undertake this testing? No, I don't. Um, and how did you learn the results of the tests? As I said in my statement, um, I remember Dr Han called me over to his office and um, showed me the letter from Dr Follett with the names of the children who had been infected with H um, HTLB3, as it was known then. Um, these were children that had been treated at York Hill. Not all of them were still at York Hill. And, uh, yeah, and I, I know that Dr Han, um, in his evidence, uh, didn't have a clear memory of that, but I did, because as I say, you know, we were very worried that some of our patients would be infected and it was there written in black and white that they, they were, it was, a, it was an awful, um, an awful moment, yes. You told us, Dr Pettigrew, you went on maternity leave, I think, in early 1985 and right, came back yes. in May. D does that help you with helping us about when this testing might have taken place? Yes, I, I haven't remembered, I, as I say, I tend to keep my professional and personal life at that time separate and I'd forgotten when I was giving evidence at the Penrose Inquiry that I had, well, in fact, I, anyway, it was when I saw the letter that um, you sent with the documents that I'd written to Dr Taylor about the patient who had transferred and I noticed that the patient had transferred to Inverness who had been found HDLB3 positive. And I noticed the date in that, the 17th of May, 1985. And I thought, well, oh, wait a minute, 1985. Well, my son was born in February, 85. So I must have been on maternity leave up until the beginning of May. And so I presume that letter came in just after I came back from maternity leave. Um, we'll just have a look at the letter, if we may. Um, it's GMCO 0001690 underscore 055. Please. So we can see it is a letter from you, 17th of May 1985, um, to the Regional Blood Transfusion Centre in Inverness. Um, about a patient, and I'm not going to ask you anything about the individual patient, but a patient who was who had been treated at York Hill with mainly commercial factor concentrates and, and presumably was now being treated elsewhere. D d you, it says, Dr. Follett of Rochelle has recently looked at samples stored from haemophiliacs over the years. Um, these samples have been sent for hepatitis B analysis and found that several of our patients were HTLB3 AB positive. Um, I'm afraid that X is one of these patients and I thought that you ought to be informed so that you can arrange for appropriate measures to be taken. Um, first of all, in terms of timing, the fact that you were sending this letter in May and it refers to Dr Follett having recently looked at samples, does that suggest that the process of testing um, um, was taking place perhaps in the spring of 1985 rather than earlier in, in perhaps 1984 when you went off on maternity leave? That certainly is, it is a suggestion, but I think you've probably seen work that was done later by Dr Chalmers to try and look back and see when patients were infected. And looking at those results of first positive and last negative, Dr Follett might have been testing them in, um, in 84, late 84. Um, uh, and this would suggests that the, that the testing undertaken by Dr Follett was not limited to the tests of patients who were still being treated at York Hill. Dr Follett was, for whatever reason, looking more widely at patients who had previously been treated at York Hill. Well, I presume, I presume that he had specimens that were sent from York Hill stored, separate from specimens that were sent from the Royal. I presume... So he presumably, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of presumptions here, that I presume that he was testing those stored specimens that had been received, sent to him 
from York Hill. Um, what can you recall about the arrangements that were made to tell the parents of these children that their boys were infected with HTLV3? Well, um, when uh, I was in Dr. Han's office and he showed me the letter, um, is it possible to take that one off this? Thanks. Um, he was of the opinion that we should inform the parents as soon as possible about these results. And it was uh, decided that if I saw any of the parents um, in the daybed area, that um, I should inform them. And uh, otherwise, um, we would arrange to bring the, the parents to the next routine haemophilia clinic, which would have been within four weeks of receiving that letter. Um, I don't think there was a detailed discussion about what to tell them, um, except um, that the, the test um, said, indicated that their child had been infected with the HTLV virus and that we didn't know at that time how many patients infected with the virus would then go on to develop um, the condition of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It was also that the fact that the test at that time um, was thought not to be uh, absolutely reliable and that we would pr probably have to undertake confirmatory testing um, and that we would uh, you know, follow up with the boys very carefully in the future. Um, was the, was the task of telling the parents effectively delegated to, to you to undertake? So only those parents who I had the opportunity to speak to before Dr Han and I gave the results to the parents um, at the, the next hema, routine haemophilia clinic. Bearing in mind what you told us about the dates when you were off on maternity leave, Dr Pettigrew, um, does it follow that the process of telling parents the results is probably a process that began in May of 1985? Yes, I think it would begin, as I say, I, I think I probably sent that letter uh, fairly promptly after we'd received the results. So the process of telling the parents would have begun, begun um, you know, it, well, straight after receiving that letter, yes, or my seeing that letter. Um, the, the, the letter that we looked at, and again, I'm not asking you about the individual patient, but the letter that we looked at is you telling another clinician the, 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 the result. Um, would the parent by that stage have been told or, or, or was the purpose of sending the letter so that the local clinician would provide um, the diagnosis to the parent? Well, the local clinician would be the clinician responsible for looking after that uh, boy. We didn't have any, uh, it wouldn't, I don't think it would have been normal practice at that time for us to write directly to the, the parents. It would be the responsibility of the clinician res who was caring for the child at the time to, and that's why I, I left it in terms of appropriate action because. Um, obviously, I couldn't dictate to a consultant what action he should take, but uh, I assume that he would appreciate um, the, the steps that would have to be taken. And you see, we didn't have an address, and I don't think we would have written to the parents. I think we would have done it through that process of um, uh, informing the consultant in charge of the, the patient's care. So patients who... At the time, sorry. So patients who are being treated at other hospitals now would... You, you would you would notify the, the the treating clinician in relation to any patients of yours who had by that time transferred to the care of the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow was, was it the same arrangement that that the results would be notified to Dr Forbes or Dr Lowe or whoever it might have been yeah. and I presume they were probably had tested those patients anyway so in they, they did inform them of the results yes so the parents who you were telling were the parents of the children who were still being treated at York Hill? And I think the number was 10 or 11. 
Well, just look at the, the Penrose report in terms of the overall numbers. Um, yeah. PRSE 307002, please, Shamix. Yeah. Could we go to... It's page 98 using the internal pagination, Shamix, so I think it might be something like page 109. It. So under the heading Royal Hospital for Sick Children, York Hill, paragraph 3.284 says Dr. Elizabeth Chalmers, director of the Haemophilia Centre at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, York Hill, Glasgow, provided evidence that 21 children were infected with HIV as a result of their treatment at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. All 21 children had haemophilia A, 19 had severe haemophilia and two had moderate haemophilia. Um, and then in the next paragraph, it goes on to say that all the children received both an SMBTS and commercial product, in particular factor eight. Uh, for 12 of the 21 children, the dates of the last negative and first positive HIV tests are known. Uh, two of the 12 children seroconverted between January 1980 and January 1981. One child seroconverted in 1981. Three children seroconverted in 1981 to 82. Four children seroconverted in 1982 to 83. One child seroconverted between 1981 and 1983, and one child seroconverted between 1982 and 1984. For nine of the 12 to 21 children, the date of the last negative test for HIV is not known. And if we go to the next page, please, Shamik, we can see a table, table 3.18, um, which sets out um, the, the 21 uh, children referred to here as Y1 through to Y21, dates of the last negative sample, first positive, and so on. Um, your recollection of there being perhaps around 10 or so children, does that reflect that was the number of children, as far as you can recall, that you had to tell because they were, they were still being treated at York Hill at the time? Yes, that's correct. There's something about that table that I'm not quite understand. If, if you look at um, Y7, I don't know. Y7, uh, first positive was 15.585. So I'm, I'm not sure if that, well, I presume that must have been in the letter that we got from Dr. Follett, but it's quite late in the scheme of things. So, I, so, I, so I'm, I'm just pointing that out that I'm not okay. sure about what the situation is there. Okay, thank There's you. another one, Y1. Uh, that's April. Yes, so it's eight, one's yeah. April, one's May. They're, they're both late, if you, if you think about it that way. Well, mm, yes, but for a first positive to be discovered in 15585 um, and there's one 15 the, the, the other one there's other ones in January 85 first positives um, it was just something when I, I looked at that it, it puzzled me a wee bit um, it, it, it might suggest that the the testing if it, if it, if all 21 were tested the same time, the samples were tested at the same time. The testing must have taken place after the 15th of May 1985. Well, up until the 15th of May 1985, yes. Well, the testing must have been after, because the first positive test is that date. Well, uh, and this is this is looking back at on samples. Yes, but that that. So it may have been on the 15th or, or earlier. Yes, that would have been tested on the 15th of May 1985. So it, it would have, I, I think not tested on that date, but a sample taken on that date, surely. Yes, but that, that well, date I, I, was... I, let, me let, me, let, me, let me tell you, if I, I may be wrong, but the way that I, I'm looking at it at the moment is that the this is somebody who's got a, a file in front of him containing a sample. 
the sample is dated because it's the date the sample was taken. A number of different samples would have been taken over time from each patient. And so each patient may have, let's say, 10 samples. He checks to see which, uh, if the latest sample shows uh, that they are positive. If they're negative, there's not a problem. Uh, if he does discover that that is uh, positive, he needs to go back uh, to see whether earlier samples also show positivity. So he works his way back through. The, in the hypothesis, I've taken 10 samples to see the previous samples, and eventually comes to the earliest in which he has negative. Now, yes. that, that's, that's the process which I imagine, in my mind, it was going on. But uh, I may be wrong about that. But no, that, does that coincide with your, your, uh, your concept? I think that is what, what happened. So um, it must then follow that all of the 21 are, are 21 who tested positive at some time. The, they must all have been first positive before the date of the testing done by, uh, 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 by, the, by Dr. Follett. Uh, and that would suggest to me at the moment from this table that the testing probably took place uh, at the earliest on the 15th of May 1985. It can't have been earlier than that because otherwise why would you get these later first positives coming in? Everyone, by definition, everyone on the list has been positive on, on a test sometime in 84, 85, 85 it must be. Uh, and then you look back and see when when first. Isn't that how it would work? It, yes, uh -huh. it, um, I think you're quite right, Sir Brian. I just, that so, first positive on the 15th of May 1985 is, is relatively late. It is, yes. Sorry, um, it was just something I noticed. Could, could we look at PRSE 302066? which is a note of a meeting of haemophilia directors and SNBTS representatives on the 29th of November 1984. Sure, PRSE 0002066. So um, you'll see the date at the top of the page um, Dr. Pettigrew, and we can see that Dr. Gibson attended. I, is it fair to assume that Dr. Gibson was the representative of the Royal Hospital for Sick Children at this meeting? Yes, she would be. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the bottom of the page, page five, oh, sorry, paragraph five, we can see it, it's being said Dr. Gibson reported the anxiety felt by parents of haemophiliac children treated at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, Glasgow, where imported factor eight had been used until relatively recently. Five out of ten of these patients were HTLV3 antibody positive. Now, this would tend to suggest that by the end of November 1984, ten patients had been tested and five found to be HTLV3 positive. And this is before the, the period where you went off on maternity leave. Can you recall anything about that or, or, or the arrangements that were made at that earlier stage for testing? <coughs> No, I was also asked about this um, in the course of the Penrose inquiry, and I, I don't recall anything about that, and I don't know where those figures came from. So, um, you, is this right? Your first recollection of learning that some of the children you'd been treating were HDLV3 positive was, was later on in 1985, as you've already dis discussed, in May of 1985? Yes, it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as I understand it, in terms of the arrangements for telling the parents, you've described it as being either if they came in opportunistically, i.e. without a scheduled regular appointment, the opportunity would be taken to tell them, 
or as and when they came in for their next routine appointment in the clinic that by this time had been established by Dr. Han. Um, does it follow that they would have had no advanced notice or preparation for the news that was going to be broken to them because they didn't even know that their child had been tested? I think that's fair. I think there was a high index of suspicion amongst them that their child would be at risk of being infected, but certainly they wouldn't have known that they were going to be told. And can I also just make the point, I think one thing that we could have done better too is that it was generally, again, the mothers that were at on their own and it would have been, you know, with hindsight, it might have been better to sit down and work out a, a framework and a policy of how we were going to do this and include both parents because it's not the sort of information that we want to give to a mother on her own without um, somebody. Uh, um, again, does it follow from what you've, you've just said that n n express consideration wasn't given at the time to, for example, the option of, of arranging visits to the home where in their own familiar environment both parents could be given the, the news? Well, it wasn't, and that probably would have been something that we should have perhaps thought about at the time, because we were used to doing home visits anyway. Do, do you know um, how long the process of telling parents this awful information took? Well, as I say, it could take maybe up to half an hour or, you know, it wasn't something that was rushed. It was, um, I tried to spend, certainly the ones I told on my own and the ones we saw at the clinic, we tried to spend as much time as was needed with, them, with the parent. Um, and then we, Sister Murphy and I would, again, reinforce what we had discussed when we saw them back at the, the treatment at the um, day bed area. And, and prior to the process which you, you think you undertook in, in or, or after May 1985, do you know whether any parents had, had been told earlier than that of the test results? I don't think so, no. Um, and do you, you said, I think you think it waiting for them to come in at the next appointment would only perhaps have been a matter of three to four weeks. Is, yes. is it... Sorry, the clinics were at least... At, at that time, they were monthly. We increased the frequency after that. So, it, it, it you know, it wouldn't have been more than four... It, it would have been less than four weeks, perhaps two weeks, three weeks. So did every patient on home treatment get seen monthly by, by 1985? Uh, no, no. Um, but they would all... All, all patients and... Perhaps those not on home treatment would be seen at least um, six monthly or yearly at the clinic. But after we got the results, we in, um, saw the patients who we knew were antibody positive on a more regular basis, perhaps monthly or two monthly. But, but forgive me, I, I understand that once you've got once you've told the parent the result, you're seeing them more frequently. I'm just trying to sense how it would be if if you're the, a child who's seen say six monthly. We're in May of 1985, and your next appointment's not for another three, four, five months. Does that mean that un unless the parent and child came in opportunistically prior to that, they wouldn't be told the result until the next scheduled appointment, which might be for three, four, five months' time? No. Um, for that first uh, clinic after we got the results, we sent our appointments to those that, that we hadn't been given the results prior to the clinic. So you brought the, what might have been the regular scheduled appointment forward? Yes. But I don't know if the parents would have thought it was... <coughs> because the clinics hadn't been well, were established in 83, so th there may not have been a pattern recognisable as to how frequently they were being seen, if, if you see what I mean. Um, you told, I think, the Penrose Inquiry that you don't think the results were initially entered as part of the patient records because of the stigma associated with AIDS, is that right? That's correct. We were, we were very worried about confidentiality. And um, I think, as I said in my Penrose's 
statement and oral evidence, there was a lot of hysteria even amongst people working in the hospital and I think that was, has been mentioned by other clinicians giving evidence and we were very worried that this information would be uh, distributed out with the hospital. So I note the time, is this um, a, a useful moment to break? Uh, y y yes it is, but I do just want to ask, ask something if I, if, I, if I may just before we, we take a break. Um, you were, uh, at the time that these conversations happened, you were the mother yourself of uh, at least two small children. Um, and the way that you're telling us about it, uh, plainly a, a distressing experience. Do you want to say anything more about that before we take a break? Well, then it will be appropriate to take a break. Yes, Sir Brian, you're perfectly correct. It was a very, very distressing experience to, because we knew these mothers, we knew these children, we'd watched them growing up, um, and it was a, a very distressing experience to have to explain to the parents that this had happened to their child. Um, it, it, was a, 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 it was an awful time, a, a far worse time for those parents, but it was an awful time for all of us that were involved in the care as well at the time. And you've thought about it, uh, I, I, I suspect, a lot since. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I knew that some of these children <coughs> had died. Um, and it, it's just um, an awful, awful, awful tragedy. Well, we'll, we'll take a break there, I think. Um, and take a break until five past two. Thank you, sir. Five past two.